The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. The most distinctive way that Jesus describes himself as the good shepherd is his willingness to lay down his life for the sheep. Uh, good shepherds are both tough and tender, right? They take care of the sheep and they shoot the wolves. See, the strength of the shepherd is comforting to the sheep, but the strength of the shepherd, don't miss it, is a terror to the enemy. The Bible has a lot to say to fathers. You almost get the feeling that God is of the opinion that fatherhood is a high risk, high reward endeavor, because it is. There's no other human relationship with higher potential for bad than fatherhood gone wrong. There's no other human relationship with higher potential for good than fatherhood gone right. It's almost like we need a really big God. The kind of God who runs armies of angels on our side, helping us, strengthening us, and with us. The kind of God who commands legions of warriors. We need a God like that, do we not? So you don't give me the whole like, you know what, I'm a, I'm a lover, not a fighter. That's a bunch of crap. Because if you love someone, by definition, you'll fight for them. The first role of a father is to come alongside their children, which means as a father, you gotta be there. You gotta provide them with your presence because moments matter. Moments mark us. And guess what? You know what our kids are gonna do because they're just like us? They're gonna screw it up. They're gonna fail, they're gonna fall flat on their face. And in that moment, you know what they need? They need a father who will encourage them. See, I've spent way too much time worrying about what I don't want them to become, but not enough time dreaming and planning and putting into practice, aiming them at Jesus. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. I started thinking about that and I thought, you know what, that's gotta be my next tattoo. And so that's what I did. I got this, I got this tattoo and every arrow has one of my kids' names on it. And the kids love it. It's a great reminder for them and it's a great reminder for me this is the way to parent your kids. View them that way as arrows at the hand of a warrior. Children aimed in a direction for a purpose with a goal of sending them out and hitting their mark. A father's job is to come alongside and help his children reach and achieve and accomplish things that they can only accomplish with you beside them. Think about that for a second. Who does that sound like? It sounds like God. It's exactly what God has done for us. God tells us to do things, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, that are impossible for us to do. Love, serve, honor, protect, provide, be faithful. All of that would be an absolutely crushing burden if he didn't promise to bear it. He bore our sin, he bore our shame. What else do you think he's not willing to bear? He went to a cross, what else do you think he won't carry for us? He promises that he will be with us and he will help us in our time of need. So as fathers, why would it be any different for us with our kids? We gotta be there, we gotta be present, we gotta come alongside and we gotta help. What are you intentionally aiming your kids at? What's your plan? What's the target? Because here's the deal, if you do this haphazardly, if you don't have a plan, if you don't have a target, they're still dangerous. If you have no idea where, you are, where you're aiming, a lot of people are gonna get hurt in the process. The only target that matters is Jesus. At the end of the day, I really don't care what their profession ends up being, whether they're rich, poor, blue collar, or white collar, I just want my children to follow Jesus. I am not in charge of how those arrows fly after I let them go. All we're in charge of is where we aimed them and what direction they were heading when we let them go. The one who's in charge of where they go and how they fly, oh, well, they're in good hands because he's the God of the angel armies. My name's Cameron Cruz. I go by the name Crucifix. I'm a uh, follower of Christ, a husband, a father, and a recording artist in that order. I was born in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, spent about the first 12 years of my life in Atlanta. And then I remember one night at church, a uh, missionary came in and showed some slides from Congo. And uh, my dad just felt it heavy on him. You know, you need to go to Africa. And my mom's sitting on the other side of the church and she feels that pull. So when I was 12 years old, we moved to, uh, to Congo. I remember one night in Congo, um, I was outside playing in the front yard and uh, we started hearing gunshots. And then the, the pistol fire turns to, to AK fire and it starts to get a little bit heavier and heavier. Sun starts to set and my dad comes out and he's like, you guys need to go ahead and just come in. And so uh, the gunshots started getting closer and the, uh, the screaming started getting closer. I remember my dad, 
he got up from the hallway and he ran into the bathroom. There was a psalm that sat over our toilet and I'd never read it. He, he pulled it down off the wall, it was framed. And he brings it in and he sits down and he reads the words of the psalm. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord that he is my refuge and my fortress. My God in him will I trust. And surely he shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler and from the perilous pestilence. And he shall cover you with his feathers and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth will be your shield and your buckler. And you shall not be afraid of the terror by night or the arrow that flies by day. Because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high your dwelling place, no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come near your dwelling. For he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all of your ways. The last part of the psalm that really, really stood out to me the most, that we prayed and prayed the hardest was, you know, God, if, if we have nothing else to hold on to, this is all that we got, then God, somehow let your angels take charge over us, take, take charge over my dad, take charge over my, my mother and my sisters. And you could hear the, the voices of the soldiers as they started coming down our street. My dad looks at me and he hands me a machete. And he says, when the soldiers come in, let them take whatever they want. But if, if they try to touch your mom or your sisters, and he looks me in the eye and he says, I want you to know that you're gonna die. He said, but I want you to kill as many of them as you can before you die to keep your mom and sisters from being raped. I'm 12 years old, looking through this hallway at the front door, the voices of the soldiers at the front gate, and then everything was silent. It moved on. The next day we got up, we, we crossed the border to Rwanda until everything died down. We come back and a lady selling vegetables comes up to our gate and she looks at my mom and she says, do you want to know why the soldiers didn't hit your house that night? The lady said, you know, I sell vegetables on the street. The soldiers grabbed me. They said, you know who has money. They got to our house and she said, there's some Americans that live here. The soldiers started to come through our gate. They somehow were terrified. They said they saw tall men standing around our house. After that night in Congo, we moved across the border to Rwanda, which at the time was more politically stable. And uh, we were in Kigali, the capital city of Rwanda, when the Rwandan genocide broke out. We drove uh, from Kigali through a series of back roads uh, to the neighboring country of Burundi and we were able to meet up with, uh, with the, the U.S. Embassy there. They fed us rations, put us on a, uh, a C-130 and flew us to Nairobi, Kenya. So we leave Kenya in 1996 and move back to Atlanta. And we were involved in the Baptist Church. I, I had no, I didn't fit in there. I had no connection with anybody there. I started hanging out with a couple kids on the bus that were gang members and they could relate. For the first time I felt like, hey, I fit in, you know? Like, I, I feel like I have some type of purpose. I feel like I have some type of meaning. I, I think I found who I am. Because they'd seen death, they'd seen conflict, they'd seen some of the same things you had seen. Exactly. It was just, it, it started a downward spiral that just, just went out of control. I started selling guns uh, at school. I started selling drugs at school. I was homeless for about close to two years living in crack houses uh, in Atlanta. My girlfriend at the time, she, she didn't come from a, a, a rough background like that. And she was homeless with me. She was pregnant, slept out on the concrete in 32 degrees. When I saw her shaking all night, that was when it hit me. It's time to man up. I was like, I gotta get it together. That getting together process was like a seven year process. Um, now I got a beautiful family, man. The greatest gift that, that God has given me in this life, man. And it's a constant reminder of responsibility, you know? Being able to be a father has given me such a different perspective on being a Christian. Because now I'm able to look at my kids and understand what unconditional 
love means, to know what it's like to look that child in the eye and say, I would die for you, I would fight for you, regardless whether you want me to or not. My oldest daughter is 13 years old, and uh, man, she's beautiful, she's gorgeous. I love her to death. My daughter had her phone, and uh, you know she had some boys texting her. And so, I got the phone one day, and I was reading through some of the text messages, and uh, this little boy asked for some nude pics. And I was proud of my daughter, because she was like, look, I don't do that. Next morning, he writes back, hey babe, hey babe, hey babe. So I get the phone. Hey babe, you wanna see some pics? And he's like, yeah. So I sent him some pics. Yeah, this particular pic was one that we shot uh, for an album. I thought it would be appropriate. I told him, I said, why don't you take a second to just let that picture sink in. <laughs> I, in and of myself, do not have the strength to be the father, to be the husband, to be the Christian, you know, that I need to be. But one thing I do know is that the God of the angel armies that stood outside my house that night when I was clutching a machete, looking death in the face, that the God who can sovereignly protect will continue to do so. That that God who can shepherd you through the valley of the shadow of death in its realest form can shepherd you through the valley of temptation in your home. He can shepherd you through the valley of parenthood, through the valley of being a husband and, or a wife, the valley of marriage. I hold on to the fact that trials are gonna come. But you know what, man? I know who goes before me. Darkness fills the night You cannot hide the light So whom shall I fear? And crush the enemy Underneath my feet You are my sword and shield Though trouble lingers still So whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me, I know who stands behind The God of angel armies is always by my side The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine The God of angel armies is always by my side My strength is in your name For you alone can save You will deliver me Yours is the victory Whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? I know who goes before me
God of angel armies is always by my side. The one who reigns forever, he is a friend of mine. Now you know why I'm losing my voice. It's all because of that song right there. And I don't know what it is that you uh, think is too big, too far gone, insurmountable, or just beyond hope or beyond repair. All I know is what you need to know is we worship the God of the angel armies. That's all. So let's, uh, let's talk to him right now. God. Father, God of the angel armies, God of the universe, the one who spoke all this into existence and knitted us together in our mother's womb. God, you, you have a purpose and a plan for us. You want good for us. God, sometimes we don't believe that. Sometimes we can't see that. But God, that's only when we take our eyes off of you. Forget who you are and what you've done. You proved your love to us. You proved your commitment to us when you sent your one and only son to do for us what we could not do for ourselves. So in the strength of and the strength of your son Jesus who carried that cross up a hill and faced death and then conquered it and came busting out of that grave three days later. Help us, go with us now to face whatever it is you would have us face. It's in Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Hey, great weekend. There's going to be buckets in the back. Prayer team people up here later. Love you. Bye.